That's, you know, putting it mildly up. And then, so that's the first leg of the stool. The second leg of the stool is illegal aliens. And the third is dead people. Uh, we had a problem in Virginia where the governor, our governor McDonald, uh, and the, our attorney general, Ken Cuccinelli and others, tried to eliminate dead people from the rolls, uh, about 10,000 of them from the voter rolls in Virginia. But this was obviously an effort at voter suppression. Uh, so I don't think that happened. Anyway, this is the coalition over which Barack Obama presides. It's what we're facing. What he is and what he is doing in his administration, I spent a lot of time in the last several years researching aspects of hard left revolutionary ruthless tactics. That's what we've got. That is what's going on here. This is a uh, uh, by the numbers uh, recapitulation of every left-wing revolution that ever happened. It has nothing to do with policy. It has nothing to do with uh, principle. It has everything to do with power. That's all it is about, and it is effective if it is not uh, adequately opposed. You cannot deal with a revolutionary uh, left uh, cadre by compromise, uh, you know, trying to conciliate, be reasonable, reach out, and so forth. That's not going to work. The only thing you can do with people like that is to defeat them. And to defeat them, you have to fight them. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, looking at the great panorama of our politics today, I see lots of uh, evidence that we're not fighting them, at least not effectively. The Republican Party seems to be totally defensive, hesitant, apologetic, back on its heels, not knowing what to do. And even some of our conservative commentariat that I see on television uh, seem to have bought into this stuff about well, Obama won the election, and so I guess we got to let him do what he was going to do. And I was talking to Ed Meese about this uh, about a month ago. We were at a conference together, and I said, Ed, do you remember after Ronald Reagan won 49 states in 1984, right? Am I right about that? Yes, I know. I think I am. I said, do you remember Tim O'Neill, who uh, was then the Speaker of the House, the Democrats, saying, you know, Reagan won the election. We well, just got to be more like Reagan. I don't remember that. You know, maybe I, you know, maybe I missed it, but uh, no, that's not the way the Democrats played. They savaged Bob Bork. They savaged Dolly North. They went after Reagan himself. They went after Ed Meeks. They, they did the whole schmear. They didn't roll over because Reagan won 49 states. They could have cared less. Their job was to try to bring him down, and they, they couldn't do it, but they tried. I often, there was some discussion of social issues uh, here in the last panel, which I heard the end of, very good panel. Um, social issues to some members of our party, the Republican Party, uh, I think means blackballing somebody from a country club. Uh, that is their idea of a social issue. Uh, to those of us who are a little bit more blue collar, it means uh, fighting for our traditional values, faith, uh, and practices from our Judeo-Christian heritage. That's what it means to me anyway. I've often thought that, looking at the scene today, that there are, the Republican Party in Congress in particular, should be staunchly pro-life because it is so often in the fetal position. <laughs> You are not going to win any battles by lying down on the floor, sucking your thumb, and saying, we lost, we lost, we lost. That ain't going to get it done. More than that, putting this in some historical framework, if we had had that kind of leadership, and we had people trying to tell us similar things back in the day, uh, back in the 60s, when some of us got started in this stuff, 
Uh, there would have never been a conservative movement. If that's the kind of leadership we had from the commentary had and the politicians of that day. We would have never had a Ronald Reagan presidency. We never had. Everything that is being said today was said back in the 60s about conservatives and about Ronald Reagan. That he couldn't win, that he was a loser, he, he was a, just a lightweight dunce. Uh, and, and that was said by people within the Republican Party. The same kind of people today who are attacking the Tea Party. Exactly the same kind of people. They're called rhinos now. Uh, we call them liberal Republicans. Same thing. However, we did not accept, some of us at least, that rhetoric then and don't accept it now, I don't think. I mentioned yesterday, and I had to repeat this. Some people here heard my remarks yesterday, but I, most of you weren't there, so I'll repeat this. When we lost the election in 1964, uh, I see Lou Euler out there. We were uh, Goldwater people back then. And we were crushed flat. We had. We were wiped out in that election. We didn't start whining and say, oh, well, no, no. But the liberal media were telling us, you're, that's it, this is the conservative. Forget it, it's over, never gonna happen, forget it. And I said to the young people I talked to yesterday that it was a very bad, very dismal time for us because we had no grief counsel. <laughs> It's hard for some young people to relate to. We did not. We did not Greek counselors. And I, other thing, I mentioned two other examples of that era. When you watch TV, and some of you heard this, we had no remotes. Or if there were people who had remotes, they were very rich people. Uh, my family did not have remotes. If you wanted to change your TV channel, you had to get up out of your chair and walk over and turn it manually. I'm serious. You know, have to do this. <laughs> Another example I cited often: the malls were not covered. <laughs> if you went from the Gap to the Radio Shack, you were outdoors, man. It could be raining or anything. We didn't know any different. That's the way we were raised. No, we were tough, tough people. <laughs> And we came out of that election fighting harder. We didn't give up. And out of that election came a person named Ronald Reagan, who gave a speech, the so time for choosing speech, and we all remember some of us of that, our demographic. Uh, uh, and I remember seeing my wife in our living room in Indianapolis, where I then was, and watching that speech and saying, that's the guy who's running for president right there. And a lot of other people saw, thought the same thing. Dude's running right for governor, and uh, so I went at me, knows that much better than I do. I won't hold forth on that any further because he is the world's expert on it. We are in a much stronger position today in terms of our positions of strength than we were then. We had no positions of strength at all in 1965. <coughs> you would never know it, but we have a majority of Republicans in the House of Representatives. Hello. That's why there is a Speaker Boehner. I don't know if you make that connection there. That means we have more Republicans than there are Democrats. That's just for some of the commentary that to reflect on. Uh, we have 30 governors, 30 Republican governors. Most of them are very staunch conservatives. That, by my old math, is 60% of all the governors in the United States. There are 24 states which have one-party governments, uh, the governor and both houses of the legislature in the, same, in the hands of the same party. 24 are Republican, 12 are Democratic, and one could go on. So there is a lot there to build on if we will build on and use it. And to say, oh, we lost, we lost, we're losers, we're losers. Uh, if you say that, you are a loser, but we should not be saying it. Something else, I was interested in the demographic data of the preceding panel, because it ties in a little bit about fertility rates. I don't know how many of you were here for that discussion. And there was some question about the declining population uh, birth rates in the United States. However, 
there is a differential within those data. The differential is between those who are of religious faith and practicing and those who are not. Those who are of religious faith and practicing have higher fertility rates. It is the unchurched, it is the irreligious, it is the purely secular who have lower fertility rates. I project those trends into the future and to put it in very blunt fashion, the liberals are aborting themselves out of existence. That's what's going on. So, breed, baby, breed. Uh, <laughs> uh, and there's some other demographics. I'm almost done that. No, I'm getting restless here. Uh, the, within the, the, the voting public as a whole, we hear a lot about the Hispanic vote, Hispanic vote, Hispanic vote. Fine, reach out to the Hispanic vote. Bring in the Hispanic vote. Get all the Hispanic votes you can. The Hispanic vote is 10% of the voting population. 10. The evangelical vote, and he guesses, 26%. The same people who tell us we reach out to the Hispanic vote are saying, kick these evangelicals in the teeth. Forget these social issues. Just get, get them out of here. We don't want those. They're so embarrassing. I go to the country club, people sneer at me. Run for pro-life. These data taken together, there are many more, I won't, I'll, I'll stop here, are uh, projection into the future, spell the inevitable defeat of liberalism. Just keep building on that base and they're going to lose, we're going to win. There's more to say, but I'll wrap, wrap up with this. Our Republican leadership needs to take the offense. And I conclude with a little anecdote about a family, uh, modern family, uh, a man and wife and two sets of children, uh, older teenage children and younger uh, uh, siblings about five, six years old. And as often happens in families like that, the younger <coughs> children started imitating and picking up the language of the older children trying to be cool. And they got into some fairly, uh, you know, off-color language doing this. So one day the father, the liberated household, comes down to prepare the breakfast for the children. He turns to the, the teenagers are gone. He turns to the little boy and says, what would you like for breakfast? And the little boy says, what the hell, I might as well have some cornflakes. The father is shocked. He reaches out and smacks the kid in the face. He said, we don't talk like that in this house. And I don't want to hear that again. And he turns to the little girl and says, now what would you like for breakfast? She says, you can bet your ass it won't be cornflakes. Some the moral of which is it's not bad attitude, it's a good idea to know the reason for it. <laughs> and I think I've given you part of that. Thank you very much. Uh, Stan, we'll be doing the floor show on the board tonight at 7. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is uh, Bruce Fine. Uh, Bruce began the uh, Reagan administration as Associate Attorney General. Department of Justice uh, before he became General Counsel for the FCC and then was on the Hill working with the Joint Congressional Committee on Covert Arms Sales to Iran. Uh, between 85 and really recently, you might be familiar with his regular commentary columns for the Washington Times. Uh, he's the chairman of the American Freedom Agenda and is also currently a principal of the Litchfield Group. His most recent book is Constitution in Peril, The Life and Death Struggle for Our Constitution and Democracy. Bruce Fine. Thank you. Following uh, M. Stanton Evans is a little bit like following Demosthenes and hoping for an improvement. I want to discuss the final end of the state as the fundamental principle of the American Republic, and I don't think it's subject to debate. It was decided by those who fought at Valley Forge, uh, later on at Cemetery Ridge, Omaha Beach. It's not subject to debate. And the founding idea behind our government, the 
be distinguished from private sector activity, was that the final end of the state was to make men and women free to develop their faculties. The glory of the republic was liberty, not empire, not telling other countries what to do. It was liberty. And that all those mechanisms of government should be measured against that goal. Does it maximize and promote the individual liberty to develop their faculties without predation on others? Or does it subtract from that goal? The idea is one of human dignity. We all captains of our fate. We need to be morally accountable for our own destiny, for good or for ill. We did not want to be dependent upon government by others to drive our trajectory. And to implement this idea of the final end of the state, we drafted the Constitution, whose foremost principle, really perhaps the greatest idea in the history of civilization, is due process. Due process, the first recognition by man that he could be wrong. You need to hear two sides. We need impartial decisions before anyone is deprived of life, liberty, or property. Due process is the beginning of civilization <coughs> itself. It's something that has been tarnished, destroyed under certainly this administration. And to give an example of how truly frightening the legal architecture under which we live is, uh, you can examine the Justice Department's views of the executive authority of the occupant of the White House to use lethal force on anyone who he decides in secret creates some kind of danger somehow, somewhere, at some future time to some undefined interest of the United States. Now, Ken spoke about Nietzsche and God being dead, and I once wrote an article about saying, well, God is alive, he sits in the White House and claiming the power to kill anyone he wishes by his unilateral decree. You can't get any higher than that. Indeed, it's a more harrowing authority than has ever been claimed by any tyrant, beginning with Genghis Khan, by Ivan the Terrible. You can't even think of endowing any individual with that authority of life or death to be made in secret on one individual's decision alone. This is the United States of America that overthrew King George III in part because he was denying Americans a right to jury trial. You're a peasant, you don't get any trial at all. The second major principle in our Constitution that advanced the final end of government was the notion of the limited authority of government. Now why was that choice made? The founders understood that men in a state of nature, uh, given ordinary depravities, would do very antisocial things. There needed to be some government. Otherwise, as Hobbes remarked in his Leviathan, life would be poor, brutish, nasty, and short. But they believed that the even greater danger was a government that was not controlling itself. That of all the evil individuals can do, they are dwarfed by the evils that government can perpetrate. Whether it's Mao's 100 million deaths or Stalin's 80 million or otherwise, you all know your history. And therefore they devised this system of limited government by enumerating only certain subjects that the government can operate on. In the United States Constitution, it's largely Article I. And even more important, in order to check the excessive use of those limited authorities, they developed the idea of separation of powers. Separation of powers based upon the idea that men and women are not angels. If that were true, we'd need no government at all. But ambition needed to be made to counteract ambition. Indeed, it was said in the Federalist Papers that the very definition of tyranny was the combination of legislative, executive, and judicial powers in one branch or one person. The very definition of tyranny that provoked the American Revolution. And I say we now have an executive branch that has been endowed with the authority to play prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner to kill Americans. Every single branch of government combined in one. 
the definition of tyranny. Now, the response that the Constitution provided for such usurpation was simple. Article 2, Section 4 provided for impeachment and removal from office of those officials, including the President, guilty of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. And when the Constitutional Convention was discussing the impeachment power, Benjamin Franklin described it as a substitute for assassinating tyrants. The civilized way in which someone who has proven an untrustworthy steward of our liberties is removed from power. It's not the guillotine like Louis XVI. It's a civilized legal method for preserving <coughs> our liberties. Now, unfortunately, it's used as something like HIV or AIDS. You just can't go near the impeachment authority. But that is the only check the Founding Fathers recognized that could contain executive branch abuses. Otherwise, it simply defies the Constitution with impunity if Congress will not step up to the plate. It was equally understood as a fundamental principle of our Constitution and our government was that we do not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Those are the words of John Quincy Adams, then Secretary of State in his July 4th, 1821 address to Congress. The Founding Fathers understood that there was an irreconcilability between permanent war and liberty. And James Madison explained that those powers that were initially conceived to address foreign dangers invariably come home to destroy domestic liberty. The founders thus entrusted exclusively to Congress the decision <coughs> to go to war, to cross the Rubicon from peace to war. A very momentous decision because, ladies and gentlemen, the defining earmark of war is it makes what customarily is murder legal. So it's a very, very important, careful decision that you want to make. It makes what's customarily murder legal. And therefore, Congress was given the exclusive authority to make that decision, absent response to an actual attack, because the president has a conflict of interest. It was recognized and debated amongst all the founders that in times of war, the president grows in power. The secrecy, the patriotism, the money, the appointments, the footprints in the sands of time. And if you looked at the history of war, invariably initiated by executives, by monarchs, not by collective bodies. And this was one idea where those who are most in favor of the most muscular presidency, Alexander Hamilton, joined hands with the likes of James Madison, who is much more skeptical and said, yes, we cannot endow our president with the same authority as King George III or the monarch of England. And now we have a president who says, I can go to war unilaterally, anytime, any place, anywhere. He had his legal advisor at the State Department testify before the Foreign Relations Committee. We can blow up the world and it's not war in the constitutional sense if it doesn't endanger our pilots or otherwise. We could send nuclear-tipped ICBMs all over the world. It's not war. I can do that unilaterally. These are just symptoms of what I would call a post-constitutional era. We are so far beyond the first principles of the Founding Fathers. It would be unrecognizable to those 55 delegates who sat in Philadelphia in 17, to 1787 and drafted what has been described as the miracle of Philadelphia. So far beyond that we are in danger of self-ruination if something is not done to restore these final principles. In my judgment, we have a shelf life of no longer than 20 years. We will be run by a single executive. We will be reduced to vassalage and all of our liberties will be the political indulgence of the president, none of them that we will be able to serve as a right in federal courts. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is frightening. Thank you. So, on, on that cheery note, uh, I'm very happy to introduce our last uh, speaker, 
uh, who is the Ronald Reagan Distinguished Fellow Emeritus at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, I just didn't have to catch, catch cars. Thank, thanks again. Thank you very much. Uh, the Ronald Reagan Distinguished Fellow Emeritus at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, you will of course know him because of his very close association with Ronald Reagan, uh, going back to the California Governor's Mansion in 1966, and then later the second Attorney General, uh, Attorney General in Ronald Reagan's second term. Uh, at Heritage, he built and created the uh, Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, which I'm now happy to say is the Edwin Meeks III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, the Heritage Foundation, uh, headed up by David Addington, who's here uh, this afternoon. Uh, he is the most decent man I've ever worked with, and I'm honored to be associated with him. And when it comes to first principles and many other things going on in this country, he is someone for whom we should be grateful. Ed Meese. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for your very generous introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your, for your warm welcome. It's a real honor for me to be here with this distinguished panel of friends for a long time, and people who really understand our republic. You know, uh, Stan's uh, story about the little girl reminded me of another one that I heard it had to do with a situation that took place uh, early in, in the month of February of this year. Uh, the father was sitting at his breakfast table, and his daughter came down uh, dressed in a sloppy sweatshirt, and jeans with a lot of holes in them, and uh, he was quite so concerned. And she said, uh, Susie, you know, What's, uh, what's going on here? You're going to be late for school. You've got to go back and get dressed. He says, oh, don't worry, Dad. There's no school today. It's President's Day. So the father said, uh, testing this little sixth grader, said, uh, Susie, do you know what President's Day is? And Susie said, yes. It's kind of like Groundhog's Day. And the father was really confused. He said, what do you mean? Well, it's like this, Dad. It's the day when President Obama comes out of the White House and if he sees his shadow, we have another year of unemployment. <laughs> but we're talking about first principles. And the first principles that have been very well discussed here basically are those that are enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution by some very wise founders, as you heard, who were carefully prepared through their education and through their thinking to do what they could to institutionalize and preserve for the foreseeable future the idea of freedom, which is the basis, of course, for this republic. Well, uh, it's unfortunate that we have seen, particularly in the past century, considerable erosion of that freedom and because of that, it is because of the erosion of those first principles. It began really in earnest about uh, literally a hundred years or one century ago with the people who called themselves progressives and who hated the Constitution because they said it was an obstacle to what they could do for the people of America. What they really meant it was an obstacle to what they wanted to do based upon their own uh, rather strange philosophy of statism and the kinds of things that could only be done by essentially a powerful central government. And so as a result, uh, 1913, just uh, one, decade, one century ago, was a bad year for the Constitution. That was the year we got the income tax giving the central government its greatest ability to fund itself, and we also got a change in the way in which senators were elected. Before that, they were elected by the various states, and so that preserved the balance between the states and the federal government in terms of power. And when we had the direct election of senators, that took away then the ability of having them responsible basically to their states, which prior to that time were elected, they were elected through the state legislature, and instead they now were responsible to themselves only and to the electorate they represented, a very different picture than what the founders had intended. And of course today we have the continued erosion, perhaps right now more pronounced and I've seen it during my lifetime. We have a Congress, for example, that where the former speaker, uh, when asked about the constitutionality of one of the most important pieces of legislation, which had the most to do with the oppression of the people, namely Obamacare, when asked whether that was constitutional, her reply is to the person who asked, are you serious? You know, what does the Constitution have, in essence, she was saying, uh, to whether or not a piece, we have a, a particular piece of legislation.